down. Hi, welcome to After Buzz TV's Spotlight On series. I am in studio with Philip Keene. He stars on Major Crimes. He has 3,000 items of Pan Am memorabilia. Let's find out what his favorite items are when we come back. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, After Buzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin. Our That's studio really audience. Yeah. <laughs> A studio audience, you just cannot go wrong with it. And you know, it's it's amazing that there's that many people in the studio audience. I love it. Yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's at least a crowd of a thousand. I think so too, yeah. And they're all here to watch us, which of is course. great. Of yeah. course. And of course, we are joking after buzzers because we have a studio audience of zero, but you really can't go wrong with that clapping, which is my favorite intro. I love starting that way. It's great. It is fantastic. Well, everyone, I'm your host, Zoe Hewitt, and sitting to my left is Philip Keene, star of Major Crime. So before we get going, where can everyone find you on social media? Uh, I'm on Facebook, uh, Philip Keen, and he, what is it, the Twitter? Not the Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> the Twitter. As Provenza would say, uh, Twitter at Philip Keen and Instagram at Philip Keen. Okay, so. great. And I'm Zoe Hewitt. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Zoe Said What. That Zoe Said What. And as we get going, one of the things we were starting to talk about off air was that your show is one of the few on air where all of you have gone two series now playing the same characters. Now, did you ever think starting out when your character came on that you'd still be here this many years later? Never, never, never. I mean, I thought that the show, The Closer, would go for seven years, and it did. We went mm -hmm. for seven and a half. And then when they introduced the, the spinoff, Major Crimes, I thought, well, we're going to have a, you know, a good run. But now it's almost 12 years, and it's been just amazing. And that's an amazing run for any TV show. True, true. And especially to transition from one uh, platform to another mm -hmm. in, in the sense that it used to be a single point of view. It was uh, Kira Sedgwick playing Brenda Lee Johnson, and people loved her, um, and they didn't want to see any changes. But, of course, you know, she had completed her contract great great to work with and then we spun off into major crimes and we weren't really sure what was going to happen um and here we are five seasons later and the, our audience keeps growing so thank you very much for that absolutely and one of the things that i think is most fascinating about the show and which probably draws people in is mm -hmm. that all of the stars are also represent a broad cross-section of the population that's both true in age and diversity mm -hmm. and i think it was, the show was designed that way originally because when the creator, James Duff, went to uh, write the show, he wanted it to reflect Los Angeles as much as mm -hmm. possible. So not just uh, the procedure and keeping things within the letter of the law, but also what Los Angeles looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not all white, it's not all Latino, mm -hmm. it's not all black. It, there's, there's a mixture of everybody from young and old to every sort of ethnic category that you can ever think of. Yeah. And not just with all of you as the stars, but mm -hmm. also even the perps and the show exactly. as well. Exactly, yeah, th that's true. I mean, our, we have a, a great uh, rainbow, if you will, of, <laughs> uh, of perpetrators and criminals and innocent people coming through. So it's nice that it's reflective of, of um, everyone who lives here. Of society at large. True, and Especially true. now that diversity is such a buzzword. Mm -hmm. And then I feel like it's great that you also reflect age as well. Because that's a big thing as well that isn't always addressed. It's a huge thing. I mean, there's some shows that you watch that they're content with, I guess, a sort of a niche market where they're only catering to the 18 to 25, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. these markets are. But I think entertainment is a little more, is broader than that. And I, I think, you know, it's sort of the retail sort of um, model. Do you want to sell hundreds of thousands of products at a, at a discount place, mm -hmm. or do you want to sell five things that say Neiman Marcus? Mm -hmm. I think the, the broader your reach, the better <laughs> you, chances are for success. Well, I like that, except now I'm worried that we're comparing the show to like no, Walmart. No, no, I, I, <laughs> I knew that was going to be drawn to the comparison there, but that's not what I'm talking about. It's, it's really talking about reaching a broader audience, yeah. you know, rather than, than limiting yourself to a, to a, a small niche market. Absolutely, yeah. as much as I joke about that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why the fans keep coming back, and you are building also more of that younger fan base that we're true, seeing on true. Twitter and on Instagram and on the social media mm -hmm. as well. And so your character started out as just like a one-time, like in-and-out type role, but you really proved yourself to continue on and become a series regular. You've been a Thank you. Time. Yeah, it's, it's been great. It was a little... Uh... <laughs> Intimidating at first, to, to truth be told, uh, working with uh, J.K. Simmons and Kira Sedgwick, uh, John Tenney, you know, these were some heavy hitters, yeah. for me anyway, and uh, they opened their arms and accepted me and, and kind of pushed me, and uh, they were very, very helpful. And this was one of your first television roles as well, Very right? much so, yeah. I'd only done one thing before on television that was uh, playing a television reporter on a very short-lived series on ABC called The DA. 
uh, with great Stephen Weber, Sarah Paulson, uh, Bruno Campos. Um, let me see who else was in that. Uh, Jonathan DeLarco, who plays our current coroner. Yes. So everything comes full circle it sometimes. It does, yes. That's true. <laughs> and your character of Buzz is interesting because although you are now a reserve police officer on the show, mm -hmm. you were actually really one of the only civilians at the beginning. That's true. So, But it's also giving the audience another way into the show because not everybody understands maybe uh, the life of a, of a cop or a detective. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think having the point of view of a civilian techie mm -hmm. within that world offered a, a different uh, point of view. And it's funny you say that because to me also, I didn't mm -hmm. expect that that job mm -hmm. would be considered a civilian. So that was a learning experience right there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he started off getting his degree in film mm -hmm. and then started out with um, scientific investigation division. So he was mm -hmm. documenting this, that, and the other. And then because of his skills, the major crimes division asked him to work for their, mm -hmm. their division, but still not in the uh, capacity of an officer because he wasn't although now he is, he's a reserve officer, uh, earning the huge amount of $1 a year uh, for his troubles, but he, he really likes doing it, so it's a good thing. So are you gonna be retiring on that $1 a year? You never know if you, the investments that you make could pay off, you don't know. Buzz better be a good investor, this is true, right? true, yes. And did you feel like there was ever a time where you were treated differently from the cast because, oh, you're not really a police officer, we're all detectives, you know, like. There you know? was a little of that, I suppose, um, and in this episode coming up tonight, there's a reporter that refers to Buzz as a wannabe police officer. Mm -hmm. which is which is kind of funny in, in, in a sense but uh, to become a reserve officer you do have to do all of the training that ever that all the rest of the police do mm -hmm. uh, you just don't earn the same amount of money there are three different levels of uh, reserve officer and buzz has reached the highest level so in everything but pay mm -hmm. he is a full fully fledged officer of the law which is interesting too that's mm -hmm. a little bit of actual police officer knowledge yes. that i had no idea about i didn't know you could be a reserve at three different levels even. oh yeah um and so buzz carries a weapon he can make arrests and, mm -hmm. and do everything else that he needs to do uh there's a little uh what do you call it a little pop-up thing at the grove that just started mm -hmm. it's a the, the police uh, podium i guess and it's all staffed by reserve officers whenever you see people out doing crowd control mm -hmm. or maybe traffic uh dignitaries come into town most of them are reserve officers so and so I always wonder if people get a little confused sometimes with their characters. You mm -hmm. hear about like doctors on from the show ER who yes. forget that they're not really doctors. Do you think you'll be forgetting anytime soon that you aren't really a police officer? I don't think so. But when when I do hear the sirens roaring and, okay. and I see somebody uh, being pulled over, I think, mm -hmm. oh, well, no, that's not us. We're, we don't need to get involved in that. We're okay. <laughs> right, like that sense of camaraderie. Yes, like, that you, you want to feel like you're part of it. Yes. And uh, every year we do a little uh, uh, get together with the Sunshine Kids and mm -hmm. the LAPD. The kids are deputized for the day. There's a flyover by uh, LAPD helicopter mm -hmm. service, and each kid is assigned an officer. So they get to get in a patrol car or an SUV or, or mm -hmm. some, some other vehicle, and we race them through the streets of Hollywood. Uh, with lights and sirens, all the traffic lights are, are turned off for us and traffic is blocked and we run them through the city to our studio and hang out with them for the day. So we do have a close relationship with the LAPD. It's great. And do you feel like that you're in a place where you're a role model or a representative really of the police officers and the police force? because you're in this unique position of being on a show like Major Crimes? I don't know that I am specifically a role model for the police. Um, I, I don't think I've, my character's been doing this long enough to, mm -hmm. to really do that. I did want to bring some light to this reserve officer program because mm -hmm. I think it's fantastic that a lot of these guys and women volunteer their time and put their lives on the line to, to do this, you know, to make, to make mm -hmm. our neighborhood safer. Um, but I, I don't know about being a role model, really. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you mentioned the Sunshine Kids, mm -hmm. which is uh, the charity that your co-star, GW, started. GW yes, exactly. Daily. And so there's been a cookbook as well. Yeah, there, there is a Major Crimes cookbook um, where all of the cast and some of the crew contributed recipes. And uh, I think you can find that probably on the Sunshine Kids website. And a lot of us have signed them. And if anybody wants to buy one and send them back to us, we I'll, I will do my best to get everyone's signature in them. So. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah. Now, there's a great offer that exactly, you don't get every exactly. day, that's even true. more incentive. And you have a mushroom soup in there. Is that right? I do. It's really good. Um, I actually borrowed the recipe. <laughs> Maybe I misappropriated. I don't know. But it was so good that I had to include it in the book. So. And do you think there will be another cookbook coming out or... I don't know. You'd have to ask GW about that. So, okay. Mm -hmm. But you guys are game for more Oh, game more for more, recipes. yeah. We, we go out and we do uh, golf tournaments to raise money for the kids. We take them out to the beach and to Disneyland. and It's just a great way for the kids to network with one another mm -hmm. and find out what treatments work for them. And they get to forget for a little while as much as they can that they're sick. 
mm-hmm. you know, that, they're, that they've gone through chemo or they've lost a limb or, or whatever it may be, you know, and it's great for us to be able to give back just giving our time. And it's interesting, too, because it's such a serious charity. Mm-hmm. And not that nonprofits aren't serious, but there are some that I feel like we can acknowledge are a little more heavy than others. Sure, sure. And you guys are working on a very heavy show, so mm-hmm. it's a lot of heavy sometimes. True. Uh, but we have to make light of it as much as possible. I mean, even the LAPD, when they're talking about murders and things like this, there's a little gallows humor that goes mm-hmm. along with that because you're seeing such darkness all the time. You've got to bring some light into it. Otherwise, I think you'd kill yourself. It would be so heavy. I mean, it, true. it would be, it's like watching the news 24 7. I have That's to true, say. especially today, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little depressing sometimes. Yes. And you are also in a really unique position within the cast mm-hmm. because you have this sort of Chinese wall, I think is the expression. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> where you have to keep things separated um, because, of course, you're married to the show's creator. This is true. And so, how do you keep yourself still in with the cast while you're not, while you're still going home with the boss? Yeah. Um, I've learned to compartmentalize from a very young age uh, so I'm, I'm able to keep things separate as much as mm-hmm. possible uh, if something goes down on set that maybe not be that may not be as kosher as you know mm-hmm. is, is it might is it should be I can't go home and say oh, gosh do you know what happened today do you know who said this or mm-hmm. so and so did this or this blew up it's not my position to talk about that I like I said earlier to you I can confirm mm-hmm. or deny <laughs> uh, events that happen on set but I, I am not one to uh, spill the beans I'm not the mole no. and was that something you determined early on when you realized that your character would be continuing on the show yes very much it was it was more of an unconscious decision because I really just wanted to be part of the actors group mm-hmm. on set and I knew if I was to go home and and talk about things specifically Mm -hmm. that I was breaking the trust of my fellow actors you know that's a separate world which is so important because when you're working with them on set Mm -hmm. every day for long hours you also have to feel like you have each other's back that's true absolutely and in this regard it reminds me a lot of the job that I used to have when I worked for Pan Am Mm -hmm. and that we all looked out for each other we had each other's backs at all at all times and I love that you worked for Pan Am, and mm-hmm. there was something we'll definitely talk about. You weren't even born about. yet, I'll bet you, when I started working for them. But the glory days of flying that yes. I wish were still here. This is true. Well, the, the industry's changed a lot. I mean, people want to get places, you know, for a dollar. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can't blame them. But at the same time, there was an elegance and there, were, there was a... Uh, a style that mm-hmm. airlines used to have and it was it was fun I'm, I'm glad I caught the ragged ends of the glory days <laughs> <laughs> well four years is more than just even the ragged ends I mean, sure. that's a good amount of time mm-hmm. to be working and do you think that feeling that great familial relationship at Pan Am and now in major crimes do you think that having had such a hard time in high school it meant even more to you I think so I mean I was desperately searching for another family atmosphere one that was supportive um, and positive and I found that when I started working for the airline and I have it here in spades mm-hmm. uh, with major crimes uh, we all look out for each other we spend time in each other's homes we celebrate birthdays together um, sad events happy events I, I in fact I just ran into Raymond today mm-hmm. uh, who plays Detective Sanchez I saw him uh, we were doing some additional dialogue recording at Paramount today and we just hung out and had lunch I'll see him later today when he does the live Facebook chat mm-hmm. and then we'll all have dinner tonight So it's such a nice family, like you said, and you can't do better than that for a show at all. Now, I know we've got some special um, fan questions for you as well. So uh, Kathy underscore Brown 65 asks, what has been the most challenging aspect of Buzz's storyline this year? Um, I'd like to rephrase the the answer a little bit. I think the most challenging part of playing Buzz is that he is such a Boy Scout. And to paraphrase a line from Anne Frank's diary, in everything that Buzz has seen, all the murders and the nastiness and the mm-hmm. horrible things that, that people have done, he still thinks people are good at heart, mm-hmm. you know, which I, I don't know that, that I would feel that same way. So that's a little hard to play sometimes when you're reading these stories and you think to yourself, I don't know that I would have that reaction, but then that's where you have to separate yourself mm-hmm. from the character. And so do you ever feel like then the character reacts in a better way than you feel up the person would react? I don't know that it's better. I know that it's very different than maybe my initial reaction might be. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with all the things that you have to deal with true, on set. True, <laughs> true. Yes. Yeah. Well, we've got uh, Jen Lynn 219 who asks, what have you learned this season with having your character more at the forefront of storytelling and what were the challenges? Well, I learned what my stepfather's first and last names were. So <laughs> that, that's a good thing. And apparently where we lived, um, just off of Melrose. Uh-huh. Uh, so more personal things about the character and getting more insight into his, his uh, upbringing and his family. 
And when you learn those other little details, mm -hmm. do you ever go back then and think, oh, I can see how that would have affected things? Absolutely, because the writers already know this in their minds, mm -hmm. but they don't share all of it with us because we don't know how much time we're going to have to tell these stories. Mm -hmm. So unless it's going to be um, integral to the storytelling process, they don't let us know. And so do you make sure to avoid the writer's room and to avoid finding out what their ideas are for the coming episodes? For the most part, yes. I will pop my head in there every once in a while just to say hello and say, you know, I did really well on this last scene and I said all my words, so, you know, maybe write me some more. Yeah. I love that. Like, I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And Flower Power 0809 says, what's the ring that Buzz wears since the character is not married? Uh, that is yet to be revealed. I have my own ideas of what it is, but uh, this is the band that uh, my husband and I, we've been together for 23 years. We exchanged rings on a Christmas Eve many, many years ago, and I just I never take it off. And so the fans are clearly very observant yes, to, this notice is true. That. Yes. <laughs> and yeah. to notice that your character is mm -hmm. not married. Yeah. And I have to say, just personally then, I think it's wonderful that you have a ring that you say, I'm not taking it no. off. This is my relationship mm -hmm. and figure it out. And the writers out. will figure it out. They'll, they'll write something into the storyline. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that it was his father's and maybe he just kept it for sentimental reasons. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't know because it's obviously not on his left hand. Mm -hmm. So it's on his right hand. Right. So we'll figure that out. Well, it reminds me of when I asked for fan questions mm -hmm. and I sat down with Tony Dennison and yes. he has a chain that has a little, it looks like a ring on okay. it. And someone said... But that's said, where he keeps his glasses. <laughs> well, yes. someone said, what is that? Yes. And he laughed and he said, that's where I keep my yes. glasses. I realized it doesn't look like that. No, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's set up a little differently than that. <laughs> so it yeah. is. It's so funny. People really are observant. And I think mm -hmm. it goes, it speaks to how much everyone on the show touches them and touches their lives yeah. more than I think you guys maybe even realize mm -hmm. when you're shooting. Well, it's interesting you bring that up because I just found a letter that was written to me a couple, well, probably four, about four years ago. And I know a lot of people have challenges with the Rusty storyline, but what they don't realize is how important this is, this, this particular story is, because we're talking about children who have been thrown away. And this happens a lot more than, than people realize. And I was given this letter by a woman who is in charge of running uh, helping to allot funds for different uh, programs in her state. And she never really considered the, the plight of young men who've been thrown out of their homes. Mm -hmm. Within 72 hours, they're on the streets. Um, they're having to sell their, their bodies for sex to survive, to have a warm place to sleep or, or food mm -hmm. to, to, to eat. And she said because of this particular storyline, a discussion was opened among, mm -hmm. among their group. And now uh, funds are being allocated for, for this, this part of the, uh, the population. So in that, I thought that was a great thing. And that's such an amazing thing that you can be part of a platform mm -hmm. that makes that difference. You know, it's a real genuine difference. We're that partnering now with Covenant House, which is a local uh, uh, entity here in Los Angeles that has um, branches all over the United States and does all they do is outreach to kids mm -hmm. who've been um, thrown away or abandoned. And your character has a really special, meaningful relationship with the character of Rusty as sure. well. Sure. He, Rusty's sort of a, a younger brother that he never wanted, <laughs> but he's, he's come to uh, feel fondly uh, about and is trying to help him. And in turn, Rusty is helping him tell the story of what happened to Buzz's father and uncle and opening up this cold case of 30 mm -hmm. years. And is that a relationship that continues offset or offset... Um, do you have to look at each other more as colleagues? I mean, the actor who plays Rusty has been working for a long time. Exactly. It's not like this is his first rodeo. No, no, no. But he's he's much younger than I am. Yeah. Although I do enjoy it when people when we go out to lunch together, people think we're brothers. That, that <laughs> makes me feel good. Um, we we do hang out together afterwards, mm -hmm. um, and so it's nice. But one thing that I was just reminded of too is that since Sharon has adopted him as her son, he's no longer just Rusty Beck, the annoying younger brother I didn't want. He is now my boss's son. Yeah. Uh -huh. So whatever anger or, or uh, temper I might have toward him, it has to be tempered <laughs> because he is my boss's son. You know, and it's so funny that you bring that up because yes. that means you, the character, yes. and you, the human, yes. <laughs> have to deal with that a lot this in your life. This is true. This is true. Yeah. There's <laughs> a lot is, of crossover. That is life representing art and Absolutely going back right. and forth a yes. lot right there. Yeah. <laughs> And um, you also had a really interesting role that we touched upon briefly right before the closer started, mm -hmm. and that was working as a Pan Am flight attendant. That's right. And you were based in London, right? I and got was. to travel all over the world. It was amazing. Everywhere but Asia and um, the South Pacific, because we sold that portion of our route system to United, I think, in 1986, I think it was, or 85. 
Uh, anyway, um, I, I got to travel a lot all over the world and met the most amazing people. And that's what I miss most about the job are the people that I used to work with. Um, but I've got those relationships now with the people mm -hmm. I work with. And I think it's the only company that I know of that 30 years after its demise where the employees still gather together every year. Uh, we had a reunion in Savannah last year where 800 of us showed up. Wow. And now I'm on the board of a 501c3 called the Pan Am Museum Foundation. Mm -hmm. We are raising money to create a museum uh, to honor the legacy of Pan Am and everyone who worked for it. I mean, that is amazing because your collection mm -hmm. of more than 3,000 items yes. is a bit of history. It's not like Absolutely. you're just collecting, you know, this silly old stuffed no, animal not, or something. No, it's not just I mean, a matchbook or a cookie jar. Um, although I do have tons of matchbooks. And uh, cookie jars? No, no, actually, no, a savings bank. It looks like a cookie jar, but it's a little savings bank. Um, and these items, you know, you and I were discussing earlier, they're not just a matchbook or a pair of pants. Yeah. There's a story behind all of these things. And that's kind of what we're hoping, hoping to do. Uh, one p piece in particular I talked to you about earlier was a pair of uh, women's uniform pants. People would look at them and say, oh, it's just a pair of pants for, for a flight attendant. Like, no, it's not that. It's representing... Uh, a bigger story. It's yeah. when women, the ERA was was in full. Um, uh, gosh, I'm, I'm stumbling for words <laughs> here. Maybe you can help me out here. They were they were just full steam ahead exactly. at equal rights for exactly. women working. But you also mentioned equal rights for men. There was this a big lawsuit true. right before yeah. you started. 1972, uh, Diaz versus Pan Am for a reverse discrimination lawsuit mm -hmm. because they'd stopped hiring men. Um, and I can't blame them to a degree. I mean, you know, you, you want uh, good-looking, attractive women on the plane or, you know, people who are capable of doing the job, and they didn't think that men fit that bill. Well, they learned their lesson, and they started having to hire men again. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the industry changed again at, at that point. And was there ever a feeling of recognizing that you were one of the few? Because in those days when mm -hmm. you were a flight attendant, that was, there weren't a lot of men. There weren't a lot of men. It was mostly um, a female uh, workforce. Mm -hmm. And there were very few men who, who worked for the airline. Um, a lot of them had passed in the 80s, um, and a lot of them just aged out uh, mm -hmm. because they were stewards and pursers in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. And by that time, they'd already been flying for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. So their their time was, was coming to an end at that point. So. Regardless. <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> now, I asked you this in terms of major crimes, mm -hmm. but in terms of being a flight attendant, when you fly now, mm -hmm. do you look at the flight attendants and sort of make oh, them, yes. try to make them think, like, I'm with you? A little bit, a little bit. So it's a little like, you know, the police, too. It's like, yeah. I am almost with you guys. <laughs> I wish I was. Uh, but I'm, I'm always constantly critiquing, too, you mm -hmm. know, about how the job is being done and especially service. I mean, you were surprised recently on a flight that you got some wings for your child. Yeah. I haven't seen those in forever. Yeah. I know. They do not really exist anymore. No, they don't. They don't. Um, but I think things are changing again, maybe for the better. Let's hope. And so when you fly, have you been recognized from either fellow flight attendants who have moved on to other airlines or for your roles in the closer and major crimes? A little bit of both. A little bit of both. Um, so when I fly in this country, yes, it, it does happen. And you get that little wink or that nod mm -hmm. and or they'll come up to you very discreetly and they'll ask, well, aren't you on that show? Isn't this? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, yes. So they're, they're very nice about it. It's, it's nice. It's a very respectful sort of attention. Mm -hmm. Um, which is very nice for me. Uh, I can still go out in public and I'm not mobbed. And uh, which, you know, if that ever happens, I'm, I'm fine with that too. But <laughs> for now, it's great. I love it. I just feel like for something like being a flight attendant too, I always, you know, when there's something that I'm connected to in some mm -hmm. way, I want to be like, nudge, you nudge, let them I'm know. with you. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm part of the club. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. Yes. I know what you're going through. Mm -hmm. Or I give sympathize. them that look. Mm -hmm. Right, I understand. Yes. Well, what I do now, anytime that I fly, I always stop at the Seas Candy. Mm -hmm. um, what do you call it, kiosk, yeah. and I'll buy a, a box of those those suckers, you know, multi, multi, multi flavors, uh, and hand them to the crew. Like, do you just, really? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I feel like... It doesn't hurt. Are you like the nicest person on the plane for doing that? I don't know if I am or not, but, um, <laughs> you know, why not? And do you ever say, hey, I, I get what you're going through, or do you just hand them out like, hey, I'm a nice guy? I, I do. I say, you know, I used to do this job for a living. I know mm -hmm. how hard it is, and um, here's a little thank you. Now I feel like I should be doing that, no. and I feel like I, I've missed the boat all these no, years. No, 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 not at all, not at all. But they do make the joke, like, you know I have to fit into my uniform at the end of this flight. So, and yeah. Which is fascinating, too. You had talked about that, at least when you were flying, mm -hmm. that there are specific requirements for weight, or there, well, there were, were at the time. There were at the time, yes. Um, I had a maximum weight that I could reach. Um, the guides had it, too, by the mm -hmm. way, of 189 pounds. Well, I was 21 when I started and could not gain an ounce. I weighed 140 pounds. 
<laughs> so I was way, way below my, my limit. So you had a big way to go there. <laughs> I did, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like you might have picked that weight up then. What was it, season two I of did, The Closer? I did, well, season when you... five of The Closer <laughs> where um, I had an affair with the craft services cart, and I put on 35 pounds. <laughs> but you lost it. Congratulations. I did lose it, thank God, yes. <laughs> Hopefully never to be found again, yes. And I loved your comment when we were talking about this earlier. There are three cameras. That's 10 exactly, pounds of camera. Exactly, 10 pounds of camera. There's another 30 right there, yeah. But Pan Am is so fascinating as well. You've got these 3,000 items. Mm -hmm. You said they're not cataloged, but you generally have an idea what's in your collection. I have a running right? inventory in my head. I, I know the things that I don't have when I'm looking mm -hmm. through uh, specific collecting sites mm -hmm. or when I'm looking at eBay or uh, these thrift stores or secondhand shops. I almost have a sort of a, a, a Pan Am radar. I can mm -hmm. kind of hone in on these things, <laughs> emitting some sort of bat signal. And I find them and add them to the collection. I've just recently found eight posters from 1954 mm -hmm. that had not been opened um, until recently since 1954. Wow. Yeah. And, and in mint condition. That's history right It is. There. It's great. It really is. Mm -hmm. And so is it like a parent who can't have favorite children, or do you have some favorite items in your collection? Mm, no, I, I don't have a single favorite. I, I, I love them all equally, I think. Well, one of the things that you mentioned that I think mm -hmm. is fascinating and might be in my limited knowledge of your yes. collection now, my favorite, is that you said you have some plastic stirrers. Yes. And from when plastic was just becoming a thing. Exactly. Yeah, it was a new lightweight material, mm -hmm. and it was, I think, created, because we had Bakelite before this, but plastic, I think, was an invention due to uh, military, mm -hmm. World War II, and so they started making it for everyday uses, um, and we have stir sticks. Uh, I have tons of them from the 1940s through the 1990s when we stopped. Yeah. Which is so amazing because right, you don't think of certain things that are so ubiquitous now, like yes. plastic, yeah. as being something that had just come out. That's and true. yet it really is a piece of history. Yeah. And I've also got knives and lighters that we used to hand out to the passengers. And one of your other stories, speaking yes. of lighters, I love this. Can you tell everyone that story you were telling me about smoking on the planes? Oh, yes. Uh, of course, we had very strict um, rules about smoking. So they were smoking and non-smoking sections on the plane. and. Rows one through four would be non-smoking, and row five, with this invisible <laughs> wall, of course, would be the smoking section. So you're lighting up and blowing your smoke into the, the people ahead of you, which are a non-smoking section. Although they're not smoking, they're still getting the benefits. Right. Uh, but this would go throughout each cabin of the airplane. It was kind of crazy. Yeah, And I would smoke on the plane because I was a heavy smoker at the time. And in your jump seat, you were saying? Yes, with a little Dixie cup of water. Most flight attendants will know what I'm talking about <laughs> if you ever smoked. Uh, was on the bustle of the uh, the slide. So a Dixie cup of water, some matches, and a cigarette. And was the Dixie cup to put out the cigarette? Yes, you put the yes. Because I was still strapped into my seat, I couldn't reach the ashtray. It was in the in the wall. Yes. <laughs> it was in an inconvenient spot. It was. It was on the door of the lavatory. So. <laughs> and that is kind of funny. I feel like I do vaguely remember. Yes, or in the armrest of your seats. And I on these long that. flights, say from London to uh, Los Angeles, those yeah. seat ashtrays would be overflowing. I know. Yes. It's just gross. Oh, that's so weird because I had forgotten about yeah. those. Yes. And even not as sort of, I guess, strange to think about now as ashtrays, mm -hmm. but even when you used to have to rent your headphones and oh, you'd yeah. have the headphone jack right plastic, there too. plastic, really comfortable, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. And you'd buy them for like $5 mm -hmm. and you'd have to leave them behind. They'd collect them at the yes, end of the flight. Yes, because they'd change the little... Uh, rubbery things that you would stick in your ears. For sanitation purposes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now you've got this amazing collection, but mm -hmm. it's really only been shown once. Do you have more plans to show it? Yes, we are um, in uh, communications and in negotiations with the Cradle of Aviation Museum on Long Island mm -hmm. um, to take over one of their, their floors of the mezzanine uh, to house our collection. Our first exhibit is gonna be held on December 3rd of this year um, at the museum. Uh, commemorating the uh, Boeing's uh, 314, which was an old, uh, at the time it was new, uh, the largest aircraft, civilian aircraft available that used to land and take off on the water. Wow. And probably one of the most elegant ships ever, ever um, in the air. And it's so amazing, right, how airplanes themselves have mm -hmm. evolved. And oh, true. Like, the Concorde doesn't even exist anymore. No, it doesn't. But it, you know, most people probably don't know this, but it was being developed at the same time that the 747 was being developed. And that was going to be the future of air travel, was supersonic um, mm -hmm. air travel, not these big jumbo jets, because it was more about speed than capacity. And the 7-4 was supposed to be uh, relegated to cargo flights. That's why the uh, pilots were upstairs above, above, uh, above the first class oh. section, because the nose could open up and you'd load all the cargo in from the front. And push oh, you all that's to the back. interesting. Yeah. And now those are for the big, long, 
fancy flights True, across yes, the ocean. Exactly. I mean, yeah. <laughs> when yeah. you're on one of those, it's like, you know, oh, I'm going to a good destination That's with first true. class upstairs. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it was fun. We used to have a dining room upstairs. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah it was fun. And was that dining room for first class or dining room for the flight it attendants? It was for first class. Okay. Uh, they would uh, invite people up in gr uh, two groups, a group oh. of 10, then a group of 11. And passengers would be asked by name to come up and join. Mm -hmm. um, dinner would take about three hours. Wow. Yeah. I mean, dinner doesn't take three hours for me now on the ground. No, okay. alone. <laughs> but I guess if you've got 12 hours of travel time, may you as well make a three-hour dinner. People. This is before, you know, uh, personal uh, yeah. computers and uh, DVDs mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. So, Which makes such a difference yeah. now. You had to play traveling. cards and talk to people. <laughs> what? Talk to what? people? What is that? <laughs> and so you're clearly so busy collecting mm -hmm. your Pan Am memorabilia at work. Mm -hmm. What do you do in your downtime? You've got, what, six weeks coming up. I'm looking for uh, guest spots on other shows, possibly. <laughs> um, I am uh, in the process of building, uh, redoing my kitchen. Mm -hmm. So I am in talks with my contractor and uh, structural engineers because I think some steel beams are going to be uh, involved. I'm also restoring a 1955 uh, Chevy Bel Air and uh, just working around the house. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of different projects that you have your hands things. on right yeah, now. That's true. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Are you restoring the car by hand? With my friend Raymond, yes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Raymond, from, Raymond, the Raymond okay. from the show? Raymond from the show, yes. It's another thing we spend time together doing. Oh, yeah. well, that's mm -hmm. great. So how did you choose that car in particular? Um, it's an interesting story to me in that uh, James, my other half, his cousin called me and said, you know, I've got this old car that, that Grandma used to have. And it was in 1955, uh, James's parents borrowed this brand new car to drive to Louisiana to go pick up this um, orphan baby that they were going to adopt. Mm -hmm. So they drove this car from Dallas to, to uh, New Orleans and drove it back with James in, in the back seat. And it is that very same car. Wow. So it has sentimental uh, yeah. family value. So we've done a ground up restoration mm -hmm. with a, a new chassis and everything's been undercoated and all the body work's been done. So we're painstakingly put this thing back, putting this thing back together. And that would have been before seatbelts were installed in the cars yes, as well, exactly. right? Well, they were options, yes. yes. <laughs> and did this car have the seatbelt option? No, it did not, no. So will you be restoring it to get like the historic plate that you're not adding anything to it? No, it's it's going to look showroom new, but it will have all modern uh, drivetrain and engine, and it'll it'll drive better than, than a lot of the new cars today, <laughs> yes. So do you think you'll be driving this around town then? It'll be a daily driver, yes. Oh, it'll okay. It'll be fun. Mm -hmm. And how much longer do you think you'll have I'm to hoping within the next year year from today for a year from today i'm hoping it'll be done and that's still a good amount of time it is a, a good year. amount of time yes <laughs> we're still searching for the engine and the transmission but uh, you know we're looking for it and so where do you go when you need an engine like that uh you look for wrecked cars that have not the front end hasn't been destroyed and then you buy from like a wrecking yard is that yeah. the idea mm -hmm. so basically you do a lot of historical research you're right yeah I, i'm <laughs> trying to save the past i don't know what <laughs> <laughs> yes, that it's a lot of fun for that. The house that we live in is uh, was built in 1927, and I learned to do a lot of things there, uh, mm -hmm. replace plumbing and electrical and things like that. So I'm kind of bringing it back to uh, the beauty of 1927, mm -hmm. but again with modern conveniences. Uh -huh. yeah. And you did the plumbing yourself? I well, tiny little repairs. I mean, nothing, nothing major. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm learning how to do all that. Are you going to go home and James is going to say we hired a plumber? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do hire plumbers, but you know, uh, there are a few times. Pardon me, where I've had to replace toilets and mm -hmm. fix leaky faucets and things like that. So that I can do. I mean, you know? those are some really impressive skills. Well, I think as a homeowner, you need to learn how to do those things because not everybody's going to be able to show up at midnight or three in the morning. Mm -hmm. you know? Not unless you're willing to pay a pretty penny for that. This is true. Well. And who's going to answer the phone at three? <laughs> and well, it's so funny. I feel like I always hear those Mike Diamond, the smell good phone. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> His advertisements on the radio. <laughs> And every time it's they say it. It's a little odd, right? You know, <laughs> where our pants are all the way up. Okay. <laughs> and we smell good. Yes. And I like that sound effect. The I do too. <laughs> That's really great branding, though, because, look, I remember you it, and remember. I've never yeah. had to call Mike Diamond, but no. I feel like now I should. You should, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so, do you feel like you got travel sort of out of your system, or oh, no, no, where no. would you like to go next? Um, I would like to go back to Argentina. Um, I love Paris. I try to go back every year for at least a couple of weeks, if mm -hmm. I can. Um, I use my points. <laughs> <laughs> and Italy, I've not been. Although my young cousin, uh, who is at UCLA, he's just gone on a uh, month-long journey to Florence oh. to study English writers in Italy. <laughs> that so sounds like a nice excuse. <laughs> exactly, yes. So it's it's uh, English writers who were writing from Italy mm -hmm. about 
their travels. So he's studying English there. Okay. Which is odd. <laughs> in Italy. There you yes, go. Yes, <laughs> exactly. But, you know, good for him. I'm glad he could do it. And it sounds like as good an, as an excuse as any mm-hmm. to go visit Italy right now. True, true. But I can't. But you can't because no. you're working, which it's, is a good thing. Starting back to work next week, yes. <laughs> and so... When you have these breaks in between, mm-hmm. and you said you bumped into Raymond, but how often yeah. would you say then you see your other co-stars, or is it sort of like, yeah, we see each other constantly? We do see each other constantly, even after work. We um, Last year, we'd finished shooting, I think, on the 21st of November, and we all flew down to Florida mm-hmm. for a charity event because, of course, we didn't spend enough time together all year doing 23 <laughs> episodes that we couldn't get enough of each other. So we went down mm-hmm. there for five days um, and helped raise money for the Sunshine Kids charity. And then we came back, and then Kieran and I went out to dinner with her husband. Um, Raymond and I hang out on the weekends. Mm-hmm. Michael, Paul Chan, and I and Raymond, we all go out mm-hmm. golfing together. Uh, we've built bicycles together. Um, we, we'll go riding around downtown. Kieran and I were driving uh, to lunch one afternoon, and some lady rolled down her window. She said, oh, my God, you guys really do like each other. You're <laughs> hanging out together. I said, yeah, we do. It's fun. <laughs> Which is the biggest compliment of all, that it's True. not just something that you say and pay lip service to. It's something that People actually happens. People see it, and happens. It's, yeah, we are really a family. And I like that you go and list. Like, here's what I do with each of these people. Mm-hmm. There's I, different activities for yeah. different people, you know. Right. GW's not going to go play golf with me. He's <laughs> just not. I'll go have lunch with him, uh, or we'll go out to dinner, and we'll chat and things like mm-hmm. that. Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, Mary invited me over to her house not not uh, not that long ago, mm-hmm. and we went on a hike. She and I. I didn't know we were going to go on a hike. <laughs> I had suede shoes on, loafers on, but uh, we went on a hike nonetheless, and it was fun. And did the shoes make it? They did. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Without too much TLC yeah, afterwards. That's true. Yeah. Well, you know, I have to ask then before we started, we were chatting about how um, Karen was on not too long yes. ago, like just a couple of weeks, and she was telling some great stories about how all of you kind of joke around with Tony a lot, that oh, he's yes. like everyone's, you know, little brother is what she said. Yes, he is like our little brother. And GW too. I mean, GW will, uh, you know, he's not 25. <laughs> um, in, in between takes, sometimes he will nod off, if you will. So we put little post-its on him. <laughs> 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 you know, wake up, what is this? Um, you know, I'm tired, or I'm sleepy, or just rude things we'll put on the post-its and put on him. You know, he'll take them off, of course. And Tony, bless his heart, he's, he's such a sweetie. You know, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, kidding him. You know, but it's all in good fun. <laughs> but right now I feel like Karen yes. was folding out on me because yeah. that is the funniest story I've heard, that you put post-it notes oh, on yes. your co-stars. Yes, we do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, when they're asleep, you have to do things, you know? And have you, has it been, like, multiple Post-its? Have you wanted to, like, cover him in Post-its? No, we'll just put one on and we'll take pictures. So, <laughs> yeah. And he doesn't do social media, right? There's no Twitter no, friends. No, he so doesn't. I no. feel like this is something you guys are missing out on for, like, the major crimes, social media. We yeah, need I some think I, maybe this photos. year we'll, we'll start, we'll get better at that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. what sorts of things do, do his Post-its say? Um, I'm old. I'm tired. <laughs> is this really me? Why am I here? <laughs> Yeah. And so, is he more gruff like his character, or in, is he? Does he laugh along with the post? Oh, he laughs along. He laughs along <laughs> with us. Yeah, he does. And I guess that's clear because based on what Karen has said, what you've said, mm-hmm. what everyone has said, is that you guys do have this great relationship, and you we can't do. tease people if it's coming if from a mean know, place. Exactly. Yeah. No. Then, then, then it's not fun anymore. Then it's just being mean and spiteful. Yeah. yeah. Which is very different. Oh yeah, exactly. We don't have those kinds of arguments that my trailer's too far away from the set, yours is closer. Mm-hmm. I'm not coming out. I'm not doing this. That doesn't ever happen. So, which is the perfect sign of a nice, yeah. good feel on mm-hmm. set. Yeah. I feel like in ten more years, longer, when the show finally wraps up, <laughs> yes. it's going to be really difficult to find another great set like it this. It will be hard. Um, although I'm, I'm hoping that because we've all learned how to uh, live this way on set, because mm-hmm. uh, it comes from the top. It comes mm-hmm. from from Mike Robin and James Duff. They set the tone. Mm-hmm. They don't allow any nonsense, uh, any silliness like that. So everybody everybody has an equal part in telling the story, whether it's the lighting department, costumes, hair and makeup. Everybody gets to tell their bit of the story. And it all comes together because we all do work as a team. Um, that we'll be able to take that attitude wherever we go. Uh, mm-hmm. And hopefully that, that will influence whatever else is going on. And hopefully it won't be for a very long time that you even have this to address that. This is true. That. This is because true. Because the show is fantastic. Yes. You guys have your back nine. You'll be up to 21 episodes this season. Yes. This has been great. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Philip, so much oh, for so coming thank in. You. This yeah. has been fabulous. It's been easy to talk to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Where can everyone find you on social media? Uh, 
I'm on Facebook, Philip Keen, and then also on Instagram, at Philip Keen, and uh, Twitter, at Philip Keen. <laughs> Good to know. Those okay. are all easy to follow yes, then. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I'm your host, Zoe Hewitt. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Zoe Said What. That Z-O-E Said What. You can also find me on YouTube at Zoe Hewitt Hosting, where I do a weekly movie analysis show. Thanks so much for joining us here on After Buzz's Spotlight On. We'll see you next time. Thanks for the mug. <laughs> From executive producers Maria Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz you later. The views expressed herein are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.